So welcome uh, everyone uh, to uh, the new academic year of the IDC and uh, we have a slightly different uh, way of announcing things uh, starting the week after next uh, since we are now part of the bigger uh, revised version of the CFA events uh, the announcements will come from the CF uh, one. I will announce next time but that will be the last time that I send the messages and hopefully it will work uh, computerized um, um, we just had an excellent uh, colloquium, IPC colloquium, by Jens uh, Fluva. Uh, and uh, it's particularly fitting since this year uh, we celebrate 50 years for the discovery of the cosmic microwave background. Also 100 years for general relativity. So it's a very interesting year this year, 50 and 100. Uh, and we had uh, interesting results. Uh, insights about the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background in the end, and we'll hear more from him uh, in a few minutes. Um, today we'll start with uh, Lorenzo, our own, uh, Lorenzo Cironi, that will tell us about relativistic magnetic reconnection and how it illuminates laser jets, and then we'll continue with uh, Gonji Lee, uh, who became, uh, as of this month, uh, a Harvard Junior Fellow, Society of Fellows here. Uh, and she uh, stays with us after graduation. Uh, and she will talk about how to flip a binary without a spatula. <laughs> and uh, then we'll hear from Jens uh, again, uh, who is now in uh, Cambridge, England. And he will take us uh, talk, talk to us about the uh, SZ hack, fast computation of the Sunyaz and Voyage effect using temperature velocity moments. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Mercedes uh, Lopez Morales, uh, who's over there, uh, from the CFA, that will tell us about mass for the super Earth orbiting the brightest Kepler planet hosting star. Thank you. Very good. So, since I'm the first speaker, um, let me say, as they say in TV series, welcome to our new and exciting uh, season of the ITC luncheon. Um, and I will try to argue in this talk that uh, magnetic reconnection, relativistic magnetic reconnection, can actually illuminate blazer jets. And illuminate is um, like meant to be ambiguous in the sense that it provides the light and also helps to understand what is actually the dissipation mechanism that is responsible for the light that we uh, see. And there are three properties of blazer jets that I would like you to keep in mind during my talk. The first one is that blazers are um, efficient emitters. Um, in this plot of the jet power uh, versus the radiation power, the radiative power of blazer jets, one finds that about 10% of the jet power is emitted as radiation. The second point is that once analyzing the spectral signature that we get out of uh, blazers, we find that we often have a rough equipartition of energy between the emitting particles, electrons, and the magnetic field. Finally, the third property is that um, the broadband spectral energy distribution is often characterized by very uh, extended uh, distribution of photons, so very extended distribution of particles, very often with a hard slope. So the number of particles uh, in inferred differentially in energy or Lorentz factor goes like Lorentz factor through minus p, where p can be smaller than 2. So hard particle distributions are required to explain blazers. And we'll be arguing that the relativistic uh, reconnection uh, can explain all of this. Um, we need to envision jets as a, a sequence of magnetic field loops with a, a region in between um, the two loops where the polarity of the magnetic field is switching from going uh, this way from, uh, to going the other way, uh, or you can look up in Wikipedia what reconnection is and you find this beautiful movie. Um, the magnetic field lines are converging into a central region. The uh, current provided by the particles is not sufficient uh, to provide the, the gradient, the curl of the magnetic field in that region, so the field lines have to break and move to the side, left and right. This is what reconnection 101 is. The regime that we're interested in is the regime in which the magnetic energy is actually dominating over the rest mass energy of the plasma. And this is what we think is happening in blazer jets. Or alternatively, for the plasma physics aficionados, that the Alphen velocity is comparable to the speed uh, of light. And we'll be asking whether reconnection can indeed provide all of the properties that are required for the dissipation mechanism uh, at the basis of uh, blazer emission. 
So what does reconnection look like? Um, for this, we need to go into the plasma physics details of the reconnection process itself using the particle in cell method. Uh, that now that I've been here for four years, probably you're uh, very familiar with. It's basically a full plasma physics method. The particles are treated as charged particles. They interact through electromagnetic fields, which they themselves produce. So it's a loop that closes self-consistently. The disadvantage of this is that you require very large uh, simulations uh, because you need to resolve very small scales, which are often very different than the uh, large macroscopic scales of astrophysical interest. So extrapolation is needed and huge simulations are uh, needed. Um, so what does reconnection look like? We start from a setup in which the uh, reconnection region is this central region. The magnetic field is changing its direction, pointing left at the top and pointing right at the bottom, and we let it evolve and we see what happens. And you see that the reconnection is process is characterized by the formation of these islands, and there is a hierarchical tendency for these islands transitioning to larger and larger scales and merging with other islands. And at the same time, there is a constant production of small-scale islands inside what we call the reconnection uh, current layer. The other point is that uh, there are regions in this reconnection layer which are here green and blue. Those are regions where the electric field is actually larger than the magnetic field. So if you put a particle there, the particle has a high chance of being accelerated to very high energies. These are very good regions for producing high energy uh, particles. Let's study the inflows and outflows from the reconnection region in a little bit more detail. Here I'm plotting the uh, speed of inflow. So the plasma is coming from the top into the uh, middle layer and from the bottom into the middle layer at a speed that is marginally relativistic, 0.1 of the speed of light. And then it escapes from the left and from the right at ultra relativistic speeds that are approaching the speed of light. Uh, this has been predicted uh, analytically and it's beautifully confirmed uh, numerically. What the simulations can tell in addition to all of this is what is the resulting particle uh, energy spectrum. And if we, if we follow this over time, we find that the particle spectrum is approaching a power law, so a non-thermal spectrum, with a slope around 2, definitely different from a Maxwellian with the same uh, average energy. Over time, this cutoff energy will continue to higher and higher energies. So what we can get from the simulations is one, the slope, which is about two, and one and two, the fact that the maximum energy constantly grows linearly with time. So even though the simulations are on a small scales and uh, at the current stage with a few uh, million CPU hours, we can get to 10 to the three, then there is um, a valid argument for why and how you can extrapolate this maximum energy to energies that are um, actually interesting for the uh, emission. Everything that I've presented so far is based on two-dimensional simulations, which are already expensive, but unfortunately we live uh, in 3D. So one needs to perform a 3D simulation to understand whether the process is uh, actually different from what I described uh, so far. And the um, problem or the potential issue is that there is a competing mode in addition to the tiering mode that I've da just described, which gives rise to the islands that we had seen. Uh, it's called the drift kink mode in the plane perpendicular uh, to the um, two-dimensional plane where the magnetic field is. And what we see is that at early times, indeed, this drift kink mode is uh, shaping the current sheet. So that's the only mode uh, that is operating at these early times. However, for the late time evolution, it's totally unimportant. And you recover in this plane the same islands that you had seen before. And in the under dense regions, these flux tubes are the equivalent of the small scale islands that you had seen in the two dimensional movie that I uh, presented before. So, uh, once looking at uh, late enough times, uh, the importance of the drift kink mode, which could potentially disrupt this old picture, uh, is uh, greatly reduced, and the evolution continues in a very similar way as uh, for a two-dimensional simulation. And in fact, uh, once you plot the spectrum and the evolution of the spectrum as a function of time, you recover the same rough properties. The slope is still... Uh, around 2 for this representative case of a magnetization of 10, uh, evolving with time to higher and higher energies. And you recover once again that the maximum energy is growing as a function of time, linearly with time, uh, and you can extrapolate that to the energies that uh, will be giving the observed uh, emission. 
So these are uh, the details of the particle spectrum. I just want to spend one slide on the uh, physics that is accelerating the uh, particles to extreme energies. And uh, I'll be plotting one representative particle, which is shown here as, a, uh, as the, the dot there, the circle. This is one of the particles that uh, live in the simulation. And the energy of the particle is plotted in the uh, top panel. So the particle starts by drifting into the current sheet. Once it gets into the current sheet, its energy goes up. Then it's advected away. It enters this big island. Its energy stays pretty much constant. Nothing happens until the two big islands merge. And then the particle can bounce in between the two islands. This is uh, the same as a tennis ball in between two approaching players. The energy of the tennis ball will go up just because of the convergent uh, motion. So two stages are important. The first stage is the interaction with the current sheet. And then once the big islands merge, the particle bounces in between and its energy goes up as a result of the convergent motion. So where did we, did we start from? We started from asking whether uh, relativistic reconnection in blazer jets can be a viable explanation for the observed properties. And I listed three properties at the beginning. First one is that blazers are efficient emitters. The radiative power is about 10% of the overall jet power. Um, indeed, reconnection uh, properly reproduces this result. We can measure the efficiency of reconnection as the ratio of the energy that is deposited into electrons, which is available then for being radiated away. This is typically a fast cooling regime, uh, as opposed to the energy, overall energy of the flow, magnetic, rest mass, and the overall uh, internal energy. And we find that for electron positron, it's about 50% the efficiency. For electron proton, the efficiency goes down to 20%. Um, these are upper limits, so 10% is easy to get within this framework. Higher efficiencies cannot be reached. Okay, so it's reassuring the fact that reconnection gives 20% uh, or 50% in the case of an electron positron jet. And the observations are telling us that 10% uh, is the efficiency that you require. The second aspect is the equipartition. Um, roughly speaking, there is a, uh, an equipartition between the energy in the emitting particles, electrons, and the magnetic energy. This is what we infer from uh, blazer modeling. And reconnection in the magnetic islands, so those big structures um, that we have seen in the previous movies, if you compute the ratio of the uh, particle energy to the magnetic energy there, you find about 0.5. So the equipartition assumption um, is um, we are here I'm plotting like actually the ratio of electron energy to electron plus magnetic field energy. So equipartition will give 0.5. Uh, and this is uh, indeed realized for both electron positron jets and electron proton jet as a self-consistent and uh, ab initio result of magnetic reconnection. The third aspect is the presence of extended distributions and uh, the emitting particles in some cases need to have a hard slope uh, with the index p that is less than 2. And uh, indeed, we recover this as well um, by investigating the shape of the particle spectrum uh, as a function of magnetization from uh, sigma 1, so equal amounts of energy in the magnetic field and in the rest mass to start with, up to sigma 50. You see that it's always clear that it's a power law, and the index of the power law depends on uh, magnetization. And in some cases, like magnetization larger than 10, which is the red here, uh, you can have a hard slope um, that is harder than uh, 2. So once again, consistent with the uh, observations. And um, three properties that I listed at the beginning, three properties that are uh, realized by reconnection. It's a, um, in some sense a new working model for the blazer emission. The consequences are still to be fully explored, but the um, Preliminary steps, like the sort of the zeroth order comparison with the basic properties of the observations are very encouraging. And I will leave up my summary. I haven't set a good example because I'm, al I'm already late. So I will stop here and... Hmm? Well, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not giving a good example as a, an Italian who doesn't want to be that Italian. <clears throat> so the summary is here and I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Yes. That this is a very good point. Um, the 
energies, so let me say two things. Um, <clears throat> this is um, a very good statement uh, in the sense that the fact that you have a limited energy per particle, uh, once you have a power law, will set what the maximum energy is. Okay? The maximum energy in that case uh, is much larger than I'm probing here. Okay? So this, uh, this can have two implications. One uh, is the implication that indeed uh, the end result, the slope, will stay as hard as it is here, and you only um, can accelerate the particles up to the gamma max. It is still much larger, at least a factor of 10 or 30 larger than I'm showing here. Uh, the second thing that might be happening, and I have indication of this in other experiments when the sigma is even more extreme, is that the system will react such that to bring the slope back to the magic uh, slope of 2. Okay, so um, when you're trying to push the energy to higher than the naive prediction of what gamma max will be, the system readjusts and it brings uh, the slope back to a value of 2. Uh, and cooling is in addition to that, which is not in the simulation. There is potential to add synchron cooling. We have a synchron cooling module, but this will, bre this will break the, the self-similarity of big simulations, so uh, we, don't usually do. we don't usually do it. And cooling, in general, is, again, relevant for higher Lorentz factors. So the simulation was a 3D simulation, okay? Um, you can study the drift kink mode in 2D if uh, you put, if this is your simulation plane and the magnetic fields are not in the plane, but they are perpendicular to the plane. In that case, you do see only the drift kink mode. You're like getting rid of the other mode. So you can study the growth rates of the two modes uh, separately. You can do this analytically as well. And you see indeed that for most of the parameters that are relevant for uh, relativistic reconnection, the growth rate of the drift kink is indeed higher than for a tiering mode. Okay, so one would naively say, oh, my system is governed by the drift kink and the tiering will never grow. Okay, but in reality, the drift kink saturates at a very small uh, amplitude, not doing much damage to the current sheet. It's just broadening the current sheet and that's it, and then it stops. So the tiering mode at that point has time to grow and overtake and do all of the uh, late time evolution. Yes, yes. Now, the islands are also moving at comparable velocity, so the islands are relativistic as well? Yes. So the motion of the islands, um, in this case, may be 0.3. So they're not really C, but it's like 0 0.3, 0 0.5, a fair fraction of the speed of light. Uh, in the regime of relativistic reconnection, in which the uh, energy is in the magnetic field, most of the motions, apart from the inflow, are indeed uh, relativistic. Like the motion in the... Oops, now did I switch this off. But the motion in the current layer, these motions are also ultra-relativistic. So why did you restrict it to blazars and not other AGNs? Um, so the next step that I want to take is to explain why this is a viable candidate for explaining the ultra-fast uh, flares in blazars. Um, so the um, that is the direction that I want to go, and this is sort of like the zeroth order comparison for the properties of blazers. But definitely, if we uh, believe, as we, as we believe, that blazers are just AGNs that are uh, pointing to our line of sight, the same uh, emission process should be happening there. Well, I would invert the argument and saying that this can actually be a probe of the magnetization of the jet. Um, in some sense, the um, reconnection is less appealing than shocks because shocks, for example, give you a universal power law. Uh, and you have analytical arguments for that. You have numerical confirmation that we did a few years back. Um, but um, Shocks don't seem to be efficient. So if, even if the slope is kind of okay, then shocks are not efficient for these systems. Um, so reconnection is the other viable candidates. Uh, and it is true that the slope is actually changing. Um, I should say that we don't see, uh, we don't think that there is much variation 
in the sigma that is powering jets, okay? Maybe from other lines of modeling and maybe between one and maybe 10, okay? So the slopes that you will be getting are the slopes of a sigma between three and 10, like one to 10, three and 10. So you're restricting in some sense. If you wanna be more brave, then you can say, oh, I measure a slope of this, so that means then my sigma in the jet is this. I'm not claiming that, but. Um, Thank you. So now I'm going to get started. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here to share with you a main component of my thesis on how to flip a binary without using a spatula. So my main collaborators on these projects are Smada Naus, Benzie Coxis, Matt Holman, and Avi Loeb. So first of all, without using a spatula, we're using the perturbation of a distant object to perturb this closed binary. And this kind of configuration is called the hierarchical configuration, where two of the, these objects are very close to each other, and the third object is very far away. So this kind of configuration is very common in the universe. For instance, for the short period binaries, more than 90% of them have farther outer companions. And for three-body systems in particular, more than 90% of them are hierarchical. And this is because they're very stable. And for this stable hierarchical three-body system, we can treat it as the interaction of two orbital wires, where the inner wire is composed of the inner two objects, and the outer wire is composed of the outer object, opting around the center mass of the inner two objects. So the dynamics of the hierarchical three-body systems has been studied in the literature. We will cause and lead off independently study the dynamics for the system where the outer orbit is circular and when one of the inner object is a test particle. In this case, they only need to expand the Hamiltonian to the second order in some major axis ratio to all the so-called quadruple order, and they find when the inclination, the mutual inclination between the two orbital wires are over 40 degrees, the eccentricity and inclination can oscillate with a large amplitude. And recently, Smada Naus and her collaborators studied the case when the outer orbit is eccentric or when none of the inner object is a test particle. And in this case, you need higher order in the Hamiltonian to describe the dynamics. And people find that when the mutual inclination is over 40 degrees, not only the eccentricity and inclination can oscillate, the eccentricity can be excited very close to one, and inclination can be flipped over 90 degrees as shown in the figure here, with plus inclination and eccentricity and z-component angular momentum as a function of time. The cyan color shows the case when one only include the quadruple order, and the red color shows the case when we include both the quadruple order and the octuple order. And you can see that including the octuple order, the inclination can be flipped over 90 degrees, and eccentricity can be excited very close to one, where it's plus one minus eccentricity here. So this is very interesting because when the eccentricity can be excited very close to one, the pericenter distance gets reduced, and this can enhance the collision rate or tidal disruption rates. And when the inclination can be flipped over 90 degrees, it can produce the retrograde um, planets. However, people find that inclination is constrained between 40 to 140 degrees. So one may wonder what will happen if the inclination is outside of this range. So 
Uh, intuitively, one may expect that nothing very interesting will happen when the mutual inclination is low. This is because the torque between the two orbital wires is small. However, we find when the uh, inner eccentricity is high, the, in the inclination can still be flipped by about 180 degrees, and the eccentricity can be excited very close to 1, as shown in the figure here. We are starting at about 0.6 or 0.8 as the initial eccentricity. The eccentricity can be excited very close to 1. And the inclination can be flipped by about 180 degrees, like a pancake. So this is very interesting because it can increase the parameter space where the eccentricity can be excited and the inclination can be flipped. And as the eccentricity can be excited, it can also enhance the tidal disruption rates. And as the inclination can be flipped by about 180 degrees, it can produce the counter opting called Jupiters. So exactly how does the orbit flip? So I include here a movie to show how the orbit flips. So for simplicity, we take the test particle limit where one of the inner object is a test particle. So in this case, the outer orbit is stationary. So we can align the um, z-axis in this movie with the angular momentum of the outer orbit. The black arrow shows the orientation of the inner orbit, and the pink arrow shows the z-component of the black arrow. So when the pink arrow flips, it is the time when the orbit flips. So I'm going to start a movie. Are you ready? Yeah. So you can see the movie. Uh, we can see the orbit preset. The color ring is the inner orbit. We can see the uh, color ring precesses regularly to the left. And the inclination also oscillates, and then it flipped. So do you want to see it again? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you can see the orbit process is to the left, and flips, and it precesses back. So the whole process is quite uh, regular. And how about high inclination flip? So similar to the low inclination flip, I also use the test particle limit for simplicity. And the z-axis is aligned with the outer ang angular momentum of the outer orbit. And the black arrow is the orientation of the inner orbit. Pink arrow is the z-component. And the color ring is the inner orbit. So you can see that in this case, the orbit processes in a very different way. And the black arrow can see it flipped rapidly in the xy plane. So the differences is caused by the different resonances, but I'm not going to the details about the resonances in this talk. Yeah. Another very interesting thing about the coplanar flip is that when the inclination is low, we can reduce the Hamiltonian to a one degree freedom system. And then we can derive the analytical form for the flip criterion, which depends on the eccentricity and the misalignment between the <coughs> inner and outer orbit. When the eccentricity is high, it is easier to flip the orbit. And this makes sense because when the eccentricity is high, the angular momentum of the inner orbit is small, so it's easier to flip. And when the misalignment between the inner orbit and the outer orbit is high, it's also easier to flip the orbit because the interaction is stronger. And this analytical form agrees very well with the numerical results. And this is the flip criterion. And this is the flip time scale. So this coplanar flip can be applied to exoplanetary systems. And we can see that this can produce the counter opting hot Jupiters. As a reminder, hot Jupiters are massive planets with closing orbits. And it's very difficult to produce these massive planets very close to the star. So one way to resolve it is to produce the planet farther from the star and move the planets closer via either smooth migration or more violent migration, or the perturbed dynamics. And this is due to the interaction between the planet and disk. And this is due to the interactions between the planets themselves. And one may use the spin up the misalignment to help distinguish these different origins. And here I'm going to show that the hierarchical three-body dynamics which is a category of the perturbed dynamics, can produce the spin orbit misalignment up to 180 degrees. So first we have a, orbit, a planet in an eccentric orbit with a spin axis of star. And now the, spin, uh, the planetary orbit is aligned with the spin axis of the star. 
And during the perturbation of the outer object, the, the orbit can flip by about 180 degrees. And during the flips, the eccentricity gets high to allow tides to circularize the orbit and shrink the orbit and produce the counter orbiting hot Jupiters. And uh, in this way, it also stops the orbit from flipping back. So here is the numerical result where we can see that during the flip, uh, the eccentricity gets high and tides can start to shrink the orbit and circularize the orbit to produce a hot Jupiter that is counter orbiting with the spin axis of the star. And here are my conclusions. So we've seen that starting with the almost coplanar configuration, the inner orbit can flip by about 180 degrees and eccentricity can be excited. And we, for this coplanar flip, we can get analytical expression for the flip criteria and the flip time scale that agrees very well with the numerical results. And this mechanism can produce counter opting planets and this can enhance the collision rates and tidal disruption rates. And that's it. Right. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, this coplanar flip and also including high uh, inclination flip, it can produce a large, um, a high rate of collision and tidal disruption events. Yes. And um, for the simulations, uh, if we do a Monte Carlo simulation and we find usually the tidal disruption um, there are about 80% of the system end up with a tidal disruption event and about 20 that survived. <laughs> So, yeah, including this, just the point mass dynamics, not including tides or other perturbations outside of these three objects, uh, this, uh, this expression is actually constant. This is a form of the um, interaction energy that is constant, just including this gravitational dynamics. Yeah. So when the system is evolving, when eccentricity and this number is evolving, this sum is the same. Yeah, uh, this is the uh, longitude of the um, periapsis that's just showing like how these two orbits is misaligned with each other. And taking, so, so when this when eccentricity uh, e evolves, this number also evolves. These two numbers evolve together and keep this, uh, this product constant. I mean, just like percent. Yes. Yes, in fact, in this called planar uh, flip, this angle is a liberating angle that's liberating in a certain range. And, uh, and yeah, so, so this, this number is not like circulating with all the, all the way. So there are some inherent uh, properties of this. So I'm, can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm going to try to be very German and be in time. Uh, but but uh, so I, uh, my, my talk is, uh, I'm just trying to advertise uh, this package, a Z-Pack, which um, allows really fast and very accurate computation of the Sonia Seldovich effect and we we'll try to tell you why this could be interesting uh, in the future for high resolution, uh, high sensitivity measurements of individual clusters. Okay, so we know the, the thermal Sonia Seldovich effect has now been measured routinely. There's 
you know, thousands of clusters or thousand clusters uh, or a thousand clusters uh, in the catalogs from Planck, and of course SPT and ACT have uh, uh, many clusters. Um, and uh, we all know about the physics of this uh, process. There is the upscattering of CMB photons by the hot electrons inside the uh, galaxy clusters. And you get a decrement at low frequencies of the intensity, a shadow of, of uh, uh, cast at the C in the CMB. And um, around the uh, uh, 217 gigahertz, you have the zero crossing and then an increment at higher frequencies. Okay, but this, all this science at the moment, this is of course really interesting for cosmology and learning, you know, about the growth of structures and constraining cosmological parameters in this way, which is of course one of the things which are pushing this. But this is all blobology, right? This is all no resolution, just one cluster inside a beam, even diluted in, in the case of, of, uh, of um, Planck. Uh, and, and certainly in the future we will see, um, you know, measurements, high resolution, high sensitivity measurements. One of the examples which were going of, of proposed um, uh, uh, concepts which were going in this direction is uh, CCAT, for example. This was one of the reasons why I was thinking, starting to think about this. So high, high sensitivity, high resolution, what does that mean? You can actually start to do some cluster physics. You can start to try to understand what is really going on inside clusters, you know. Uh, uh, even with the sunyaev selvich effect. Of course, we have X-ray measurements which are upcoming and, and also already uh, uh, we have them in our hands, which, uh, where you can learn a lot about cluster physics themselves, but combinations of sunyaev selvich measurements in the future with cluster physics is one of the things which could be helping you to really learn uh, even more, right? Uh, and if you really want to, uh, you know, uh, do analysis of Sunyev Selvich, high resolution mosaics of Sunyev Selvich, you have to understand how to calculate the Z signal uh, uh, given, you know, cluster parameters and, and, and uh, the atmosphere model. And uh, the, one of the questions is, of course, which parameters actually matter? Right? Because uh, um, the normal understanding is always you have the number of scatterings and you have uh, the electron temperature and maybe a velocity, but that is not actually characterizing the kind of signals you will see, as I will try to say. So, um, and as CPAC, or uh, the computation of, uh, of, um, of the sunyaev selvich effect, there you have to, you have to be, uh, you know, you have to uh, understand the cluster uh, atmosphere and uh, complete uh, and calculate the, the, the kind of distortions you see along every single line of sight. Yeah? And if you have a simulation assay, uh, you can of course do that frequency by frequency, do all kind of integrals, and this is actually getting already, uh, okay, on supercomputers we don't have big problem, you can waste that time, but in reality the, the kind of link to the underlying physics is not so clear. So this is one of the questions which, uh, which is important. And then there's also the analytic uh, approximations which previously have been used, they have actually limited uh, applicability, so you, one, one of the ideas was also to overcome those. <clears throat> And uh, you can, with a CPAC, can actually include variations in the temperature and the cluster atmosphere. And there's also multiple scattering corrections, which I don't want to talk about much more. So a CPAC, that's basically the bottom line, can do all these kind of things for you, uh, can uh, calculate the sunyaev selvich effect for a given uh, uh, line of sight through a cluster in a very efficient, very fast way, and therefore can be used in the analysis of future, you know, high resolution uh, uh, CMB spectral distortion measurements in the direction of clusters. So here's just the, uh, you know, um, uh, one of the figures of, from Rashid's papers, uh, a cluster with, which is isothermal, but it has a density profile. And then the normal sunyaev selvich effect is just given by the optical depth along a line of sight multiplied with the temperature-dependent function and the frequency-dependent function. Yeah? This uh, function encodes all the scattering physics, and one has to uh, compute this. If you do this uh, uh, precisely, this is actually demanding. Uh, okay. Uh, we have supercomputers, but it's not—it's not something which takes just, uh, which is very fast, especially when you have uh, have to do this many times in the simulation box. So one of the ways to do this is asymptotic expansions. They have convergence problems because at high frequencies, uh, the scattering kernel becomes broader than the uh, typical. Uh, you know, uh, shape of the exponentials, and you're actually having a problem to really converge. So this is not something which you can uh, accurately use easily. Um, with a ZPAC, you can, for a single cluster, a single temperature, including kinematic effects, you can easily calculate the distortion shape. This is uh, just, you know, to illustrate the different kinds of contributions you could have. The thermal SZ effect uh, is the uh, dashed dotted line, then the kinematic SZ effect, and here's some higher order corrections from uh, uh, kinematic corrections, and the total uh, signal, and then the comparison with the full uh, five-dimensional integral. 
Uh, this is, uh, you know, very simple to do and, and uh, very fast, takes, takes no time and um, can work up to extremely high temperatures. Now, for everybody who looks at here, 75 kV, I'm not crazy, I'm not thinking there's clusters like that. But it's just to show that even in shocked regions where you can actually reach, let's say, 25 kV, uh, you can actually still do this kind of thermal calculations. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that is the standard thing, but a real cluster has more uh, than just a density profile. It has actually a temperature profile, it has a line of sight uh, velocity profile, it has a line of sight perpendicular line of sight uh, velocity, and all those give different ways of contributing to the signal. So how do you, how do you compress the information of this? How do, what kind of observables do you get? Well, the simple way is just think of, think of it as a Taylor expansion around the mean values, right? You just calculate the mean values along the line of sight. That gives you a zero-order signal. And then you have, uh, uh, you have, of course, the first derivative, but you're clever and you're defining the mean value so that you get rid of the first derivative. So you're just thinking about the second derivative and higher-order derivatives, right? So that gives you a bunch of numbers, which are these temperature velocity moments of the cluster uh, atmosphere. And maps of those moments are the ones which you're going to be having available in the future. When you do the mosaicing of clusters at many frequencies, you can reconstruct those maps and actually get measurements of those maps, which then can be used to reconstruct the cluster profile and temperature profile and all these things. Yeah. And as ZPAC, you just plug these numbers, which you can get from your simulation, and you get the signal. And for every single line of sight, you can do it and in that way uh, reconstruct things. So that's the idea behind this. And uh, here's just an illustration of the... Uh, one of, the, one of the functions, how it works, uh, this is details, it's not so important. Uh, what is important is to show the, uh, here uh, for the bullet cluster, these are actual measurements here, and uh, there's different models uh, inside here. The single temperature model, which is uh, the orange, which you see fails to uh, hit the point at high frequencies. Uh, then there's the two temperature case, with the, which is green, and the simple uh, uh, with, with the temperature dispersion uh, model. And you can see all of those, uh, this, the green and the blue and the red, uh, for, which is here, it's the E2 expansion, so it's an asymptotic expansion, which actually for this kind of temperature does not apply anymore. It's actually not useful because the signal is completely wrong in, the, in terms of the shape for this high temperature. You need to actually do already the full calculation. But still, all those models for the three, uh, three, four measurements actually fit uh, the, the predictions. So what this tells you is, first of all, um, uh, there is differences between the isothermal and the other models, but it also means that when you want to distinguish in detail uh, models, you actually need to cover, in particular, the high-frequency part of the sunyaev seldovich effect. Yeah. And of course, there's big problems there with dust, all these kind of things. Uh, that's uh, astrophysics. But you can nevertheless hope uh, in the future to learn about basically the temperature dispersion and uh, intrinsic structure of the cluster, which I think is uh, really exciting. So uh, as ZPAC, that's already my conclusions, um, as ZPAC uh, can deal you know, with, uh, with the physically relevant cases where you have uh, temperature and velocity profiles along the line of sight, and you do those averages, you can do those from a simulation and then predict what kind of averages you need to plug in. Or you can just think about it like you have a measurement and you analyze and get maps of those uh, averages, which are actually the real observables. This is the compression of the information into those moments. And if you're unlucky and you have very low sensitivity, you just get the average Y parameter. If you're lucky, you get as well the measured temperature and uh, optical depth independently, and if you're even more lucky, you get the temperature dispersion as well and higher moments of that. And those are maps which you then can use. Okay, uh, and yeah, you can really learn about the internal structure maybe, also including uh, multiple scattering effects. And then of course the obvious application is the, uh, the uh, combination with uh, X-ray measurements and line measurements, for example, to measure the turbulent motions of the cluster atmosphere. These kind of things are uh, interesting. There's questions, open questions uh, related, for example, what is the polarization signature? One can, in principle, treat this problem in the same way with the moment method uh, and get the velocity structure, get some handle on that. And then uh, non-thermal uh, electrons, how they contribute is another uh, aspect which one should, in principle, do. And I was promising I'm in time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. how, how much, how 
second scattering is, is a small uh, small effect, definitely. But I'm 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 hoping uh, there's one interesting aspect about this. Uh, so uh, back of the envelope and uh, uh, ta optical depth square. So it's uh, it's a one percent uh, correction to that whole business there, uh, and um, uh, so this is a small effect. Um, but uh, the here is a new aspect about this now. Um, with when you when you think about just the spectra uh, along one line of sight, uh, that, 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 that is just really f frequency uh, energy information. But when you now have a mosaicing of a cluster, you actually have spatial information. And then it's spatial spectral information, where you can actually start taking differences as well in different parts of the cluster. And you can actually see, for example, the shapes um, as a function of frequency, the cluster uh, will look differently just because of the uh, different contributions and different energies at different energies. So there is a little bit of hope that you can, by using the spectral spatial information, still disentangle and learn about those uh, uh, smaller effects as well. But nevertheless, yes, uh, multiple scattering, I think, I'm afraid, it will be very hard. So, yes, you are kind of, I think, hinting that SZ pack, apart from being able to do all of this, is also fast and efficient. So is it that you have a better way of doing the numerics, or are you pre-computing a big table? It's basically a pre-computed pre okay. big and table, but, but, but it is motivated uh, by, by the f underlying physics. So, I mean, the, the simplest thing would be just make a big grid over things. But um, you can actually, so the, the, t the asymptotic expansion does a, a Taylor expansion in both the energy shift and the temperature. Yeah, and the problem with the energy shift, that expansion doesn't converge properly. So when you don't do that expansion, but just do a Taylor expansion in temperature, and basically tabulate derivatives of the temperature, then you have a much more compressed but very, very convergent scheme. So that's so the way. So how many dimensions is this table? Oh, this, it's tiny. It's not it's nothing. Uh, and it's, it, has only, it has only temperature and, uh, well, uh, depending on what parameters, uh, temperature, velocity, and... and that's it. Okay. Yeah. Tony? One of the reasons we haven't SVT project have not published a lot of the data on the larger clusters is that when you uh, look at the data, what you find is the dominant effect is due to the gradient of the CMB behind the cluster mm -hmm. and that the, the lensing of that gradient by the cluster. So mm -hmm. that... But it, that is a thermal spectrum. So yeah. it is a thermal, thermal effect, which, which uh, in, in terms of like the energy dependence, you, you will be able to separate from. It's like a KSZ effect in that sense uh, yeah. in, in the differential. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. That depends how many frequencies you're looking at. Yeah, exactly, yeah. In the last yeah. couple of years, we've only had two frequencies. Yeah, that's... In that's, the future, mm -hmm. we will have three again. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, the lensing effect is very interesting indeed, and moving lensing effect as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah, probably. That's, uh, yeah. So while I'm doing this, um, I wanted to point out that Abby at the beginning said that this was the 100 years of general relativity, 50 years of the cosmic back, uh, of the CMB, and it's also the 20 years of the discovery of the first exoplanet around a solar type star. So. Um, and I also wanted to point out that in terms of time, if you want to get out of here early, I'm a Spaniard. So if you thought Italians were bad, <laughs> we're much worse. Anyway, so um, I'm giving the colloquium in the afternoon, so I apologize in advance if this talk is not as good. Uh, this is work that I'm doing right now, and uh, hopefully I will have it published uh, uh, in a few weeks. And uh, this is the mass of the Kepler, uh, of the brightest Kepler, uh, of, of, the, of the planet around the brightest Kepler host uh, star. 
And you might, you might be thinking, oh, you know, another planet, la, la, la. But the reason why this is important is because of TESS. We have the uh, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite coming up in a couple of years. And uh, this planet in particular uh, orbits around a, 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 an and, uh, eighth uh, magnitude star. And this is the kind of targets that TESS is going to find. So we're just trying to learn how to do this because, believe it or not, we still don't know how to characterize planet, uh, planets around very, very bright stars. And to illustrate that, uh, I show you here the uh, first result for this planet, which is called Kepler-21. It also has an HD number, so you can imagine how bright it is, but I, it's HD 17 something. And uh, this was published in 2012, and that was uh, the data from the first uh, five, uh, six quarters of uh, Kepler data. And you can see that the star was quite active, but they uh, and so that's the activity of the star, and each one of those lines is a transit. So you, so you actually can imagine it's a lot of work to pull out a transit out of those data, but they did. You know, they actually pull out a really nice transit uh, out of the preliminary Kepler data set. And then uh, they went ahead, I should say, this was Howell et al. 20, I hope that wasn't my battery. Okay. Um, so is there something to plug it in? Okay, so this is Kepler, um, this was Hubble et al. 2012, and they also tried to measure the radial velocities to confirm the mass of the planet. I mean, from the size of the planet, it seemed to be a super Earth. Uh, and, you know, they tried, they took uh, data for about, radial velocity data for about 30 days, and you see the activity of the star was kicking in. So they couldn't measure the mass of the planet, and they could only impose an upper limit of about 10 Earth masses. But they published it, you know, it was, it was the brightest Kepler star. Uh, so what we have done is um, we have followed this up with HARPS North, which is a high-resolution spectrograph, very high precision. It's a copy of the HARPS uh, spectrograph that many of you m might, might, might have heard about because it's, um, it's a European spectrograph that has discovered most of the planets via radio velocities so far. And uh, so we have uh, a copy in the north, in La Palma, in the Canary Islands, and... Uh, Keep panicking now about uh, the light on this. And um, we, we started to collect data with HARPS North to see if we could detect the mass of the planet via, via the radio velocities. At the same time, Kepler continued to collect data. So we managed to collect the full 17 quarters of Kepler and reanalyze the data in a much better way, in a sense that we produce light curves that are higher precision than the Kepler pipeline only because we have learned from the Kepler pipeline how to do it better. And I must say, this star actually is, is, is highly saturated in the Kepler images, so it takes some, some work to do this. So what you see here at the end is uh, the black dots, that's the activity of the star from our principal component analysis uh, data reduction. And then uh, the red light curve here is the light curve after removing the activity from the star. So you see how much better uh, the new uh, data analysis or uh, data products are. And this is just a zoom in of this uh, full light curve here just to show you how the activity of the star, which are the black dots, really, really mess up the uh, signal uh, of, of, of the planet. Um, these are just to show you how much better our, our light curves are right now. The, the uh, top one is the principal component analysis, um, the trended light curve, which is similar but slightly better than the uh, original Kepler light curves and you see how it is much noisier but we can actually pull out the uh, signal of the planet here but if you now look at the data from which we have removed the signal from, from the star itself you can see how it is indeed much better and we obviously get a much better uh, radius result. Um, these are the uh, um, Radio velocity data uh, on the right side is are the radio the new radio velocities that we have from HARPS. We have a total of 82 data points, and these are the uh, original high res data, uh, which are about 15 data points. So the difference is not only the amount of data points that we have, but it's also the observational uh, strategy. They only did it in 30 days. We have almost two years of data. We have more data points, and and. Uh, in, the, in the data analysis, we have done more things, like taking into account the activity on the, of the star from the light curves to see what is happening to the radial velocities. And that's how you see that from the, from the original light curve, uh, radial velocity curve, they couldn't 
uh, pull out the uh, radio velocity signal from the planet, but we can see it. And we can see it fairly nicely. Um, this is a better plot, just to highlight how much better we can actually see the uh, radio velocity signal of the planet. And uh, the red dots are, are just the same data being in uh, 10 points intervals. And then uh, the blue line is the best fit. And you see down here, uh, the amplitude of the blue line is only 2 meters per second. I might say the activity of the star, the amplitude itself of the radio velocities is over 5 meters per second. So we managed to pull out a signal of 2 meters from a, from, from a noise of 5 meters, which is, which is pretty good. And from that amplitude of the radio velocities, we derive um, a radius for the, uh, sorry, a mass for the planet of about 6 Earth masses. And unfortunately, this is only a 3 sigma uh, detection, which for the real test, um, targets, which hopefully are not as active as this particular star, uh, probably we will do much better than this, and we will produce like 10 to 15 percent error bars, which is, you know, a six, six sigma detection. Uh, so when you, when you plot um, the radius and the mass of the planet in this mass radius relation for very, very small planets, our target is here, this is uh, K21 in blue, and you see Actually, I, I should have drawn a line here because, I mean, this is, this is the interesting part of this and this is the part that is going to be the main focus of the paper, I think. Um, you can draw a line here where you see that most of the planets that we have observed with masses of less than about six Earth masses, they seem to be rocky and they seem to follow along the same line of uh, internal composition as Venus, as Earth. While as soon as you get to uh, planets that are uh, six Earth, uh, Earth masses or heavier, uh, you see that all of a sudden they have different radii, which means like different densities, and they are they are basically all over the place. So, you know, it could be that we have an observational bias here, which maybe you know we come back in five years and I tell you that this is all you know nonsense. But right now, as it is, it is looking like there's something going on. There's something happening at six Earth masses that um, makes this, this these planets be rocky instead of gaseous planets for more massive planets. So amazingly enough, I think I underestimated how long it was going to take me. So this is what I wanted to show you. And um, it's a work in progress. And I will show you more. Uh, you know, if some of you are coming to the colloquium in the afternoon, uh, I won't be talking about this. I will be talking about how you measure the atmospheres of these planets. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have right now. Yeah, 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 it can be, but I mean, that's, that's the most obvious explanation, I think, you know, like at some, well, well it's either, it's, you know, either accretes more or manages to keep it, you know, whatever it accretes, it manages to keep it because the lower the mass, the lower the gravity and the escape uh, uh, velocity is lower, so, you know, the atmosphere basically is going to escape and you only are left with a rocky uh, core. That could be one explanation. It could be observational bias. And, uh, you know, and uh, I'm saying this because I, we know that there is a lot of planets with um, uh, radii up here for which uh, the high-risk group have tried to measure masses, but they haven't been able to actually detect a mass. So they published upper limits. And the, the, the problem with the upper limits is that the error bars are so large that they cover the whole region here. But you know, I figure that in the future, as, as we manage to measure those masses, this area of the diagram might get populated, and then this is all nonsense. So. Uh, how do you make the connection between the photometric principal component and the velocity perturbation? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I should have shown a couple of fi figures on that. So we basically work with uh, periodograms. And so what we do is we fold up um, the light curves. I mean, we find the periodogram of the light curves which in this case it shows a, a period of about 13.5 days. And then we find that same period in the radio velocities. So we, we, we can say that in this particular case, the 13.5-day uh, period that we see in the radio velocities is, is actually the rotation of the star, and we can either remove it or fit it together with the signal of the planet. So that's how we use the information from both sides. 
It has nothing to do with this, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think it was not the battery, it was just the screensaver probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. That was, uh, <laughs> oh Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, especially when you do the 